the glorious one of Israel. Praise God. I have an announcement. Saturday, August 29th, at the Boston State House at 10 a.m., there's a rally to protest forced mandatory vaccination for kids in school. If you're interested, get up to the State House, make your voices known, make your voices heard. Felicia, what does it say here? Felicia's and Felicia and I are going. So, oh, that's okay. The whole family's going. So, if you'd like to go up with them, make it a day. Go up and spend a, an hour or two or whatever you can in uh, fighting this forced vaccination. This vaccination, let me tell you, is too quick. Number one. Number two. I believe there's ulterior motives involved. Now, it's an individual decision you have to make. But I'm letting you know right now, this pastor right here is not getting any vaccine. And that is that. Is that all the announcements we have? Okay, amen. Well, praise God. August 29th, mark your calendar. It's a Saturday. You can get up there to show your support. You know, that's one of the reasons why we see so much evil advance and the church don't say nothing. You know, uh, if, if you look at it, many of the people that are protesting abortion are all the Catholics. Very few Protestants go. Some, some go, but not, not as many. Can you, can you imagine if all of the fundamental pro evangelical Protestant believers got together and s said, we're going to see abortion stop? Can you imagine how many millions of people that would be? Come on, somebody. Well, you know, sometime when you prepare a message, are we on yet, Brother Bob? God bless you. I want to welcome all those watching by Facebook and Twitter and uh, YouTube. God bless you this morning or this evening, wherever you are in the world and you're watching. God bless you. We hope you're uh, going to be blessed by God's Word. Many times when you're preaching a word, you ask God for confirmation. If anyone has ever shared God's Word, you always say, God, give me a confirmation. And I want to show you what God did. The title of my message today, Sound the Alarm. That's the message I have today, Sound the Alarm. And boy, did that alarm sound, right? But many of us were worshiping the Lord. We didn't even know what was going on until somebody came and said, Hey, hey, I think there's a fire alarm going off outside. But it shows you Sometimes just how deaf we are to the things of God. Sound the alarm. And we're going to look at Joel chapter 2 this morning. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me there. Joel chapter 2. Joel prophesied against the southern kingdom, Judah. Judah means house of praise. So he was prophesying against the house of praise. The people that were supposed to be praising God. And God was speaking to Joel and he was telling him, I want you to do something for me. <clears throat> Watch out for these prophets who do, who do nothing but say everything. God told this prophet, he says, I want you to blow the trumpet in Zion. What's Zion? Zion is the city of God. It's the city of David. He says, I want you to blow the trumpet, or if you will, the shofar horn. I want you to blow this trumpet, and when you do, the Jews are going to come to attention because whenever that shofar horn was blown, and they blew it for many reasons, one was for victory in battle. One was for warning of the enemy. But one of them was from warning from God. And he said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. The holy mountain is the city of David. Now, I know that a lot of people think 
that where the Mount Sharif, that golden dome that, you know, the Muslims have up in Israel, a lot of people believe that that is the holy mountain of God. That's not the holy mountain of God. The holy mountain is in the city of David. It was Mount Zion. You look through all the scriptures, the Psalms, everything. It says, my holy mountain, my city, the city of David. That's where God built Solomon's temple. That's where God built, had Herod build the temple. It was in the city of David. It was not up on that mount. Now, some of you might call me a heretic. Some of you might think I'm crazy. Do the research. I've been researching this for almost a year now, and I'm continually researching that. And the, and the archaeological discoveries that they're coming out with are showing that the temple of God was in the city of David. One of the largest scriptures I can give you is 2 Chronicles 3, verse 1. We won't, we're not going to go there, but you can mark it down and read it later. 2 Chronicles 3, 1 is definitely shows that the Solomon built his temple in the threshing floor of Onan, the Jebusite. The Jebusites that David... Uh, conquered was south of the Temple Mount where the Skion Springs are and that's where the city that's where David built the ho I mean uh, Solomon built the house of the Lord so in the city of David in the Trump in, the, in, his, in Zion in his holy mountain God says right in the midst of everyone who thinks they're okay you can walk in Jerusalem now, and you can walk there, and all those people at the Wailing Wall that are wailing and putting prayers in the cracks and all that stuff, they think they're right with God. But Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except through me. Hello? God said in Isaiah, he says, that the Lord's hand is not... It's shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated me from you, that I will not hear you. Now that doesn't mean I'm anti-Semitic. doesn't mean that I'm anti-Israel. I'm not. You know that. But God said you can only come through my son. That's what gives us justification. That's what gives us consecration. That's what gives us permission to come before God's holy throne is the blood of Jesus. And if you don't have the blood of Jesus, you can't go before his throne. So here the prophet is told by God, he said, I want you to blow the trumpet and sound the alarm in my holy mountain. He said, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. And if you continue to read this chapter, you'll see that God has an army, but it's an army of pestilence. It's an army of locusts. If you go and you, you read first, uh, uh, first chapter of Joel, it says, The word of the Lord came, in verse 1, to Joel, the son of Bethuel. Hear this, hear this ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land, Hath this been your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. So it was something that had to be continuous. It was something that God wanted his people to understand, and to know, and not forget what he said. Come on, say in the cemetery. He says in verse 4, that which the pommel worm hath left, hath the locust eaten. That which the locust hath left, the canker worm hath eaten. And which the canker worm hath left, the caterpillar has eaten. That doesn't mean that there's four different insects there. It just means the different stages of that same insect. So there was a, a sign that God gave to Judah. And it was... The locust. What was the locust a sign of? The locust was a sign of God's judgment. In other words, the locust would come and it would show the people that they were in the midst of God's judgment. Now let me just say this to you right now. As I read that scripture, 
For the day of the Lord cometh, in verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, for it is near at hand. It's right at the door. I decided to look to see if there have been any release of locusts in the world. And in 2020, there was a release of locusts that have attacked Eastern Africa, Argentina, Brazil, India, Pakistan. And can I tell you, when they form these swarms, they are in the billions. And they go and they eat all of the agriculture that surrounds those areas and can leave a place in famine. And if you were to turn to Matthew 24 and begin to read it, you'll see some of these things. See, that's going to happen at the coming of the Lord. So I put the two and two together. And I said, Lord, is this a sign that you're coming soon? What was the sign of the locusts? If you remember the story in Exodus, chapter 10, I'm not going to turn there, but in chapter 10, Moses was there with Pharaoh and he wouldn't let the people go. And God told Moses, the prophet, to prophesy. And when he did, he lifted up his rod and God brought a mighty east wind. Hear me now. God brought a mighty east wind that brought in the swarm of locusts. Can I tell you, when the locusts started in Africa, they said it came from an east wind. Come on, somebody. <laughs> See, we have become so calloused to the voice of God and the way that God operates. We don't listen. We don't watch. We're not watchmen. We're sleeping at the gate. God says, I'm sending you. Jesus even said there shall be signs in the heavens and on the earth. Look, I'm coming back. These are the signs that I'm coming back soon. And in the time of Exodus, when that swarm of locusts came, it began to eat up all the vegetation in Egypt. And the people went to Pharaoh and they said, you know, come on, you've got to let these people go. We're going to be destroyed. And Pharaoh called for Moses. Moses came in, you know, and he said, uh, Moses, I've sinned against your God. I'm sorry. Forgive me. You know, I'm going to let your people go. But the Bible says after he did all of that, his heart was hard and even more, and he wouldn't let the people go. See, that was a transitional repentance. What I'm saying is that he, for, when that thing was happening right there, oh God, forgive me, oh, I sinned against you, God, but the moment it started to be relieved, it's the same as it was on 9-11. Some of you weren't even born yet. But when 9-11 came, Everybody was like, God, we're sorry. God, they fell on their face. They started going back to church. Churches started to be filled again. Not that that means anything. You can, be, you can fill the churches and still have empty people. And they came and they came and they came for the first two months. But then once everything settled, more people had left the church than had gone in the first place. Because there's a famine that's going on of hearing the word of the Lord. And I'm not talking about these nutcases that are out there prophesying all kind of crazy things. But I'm telling you, these signs shall come. And Jesus said, you're going to see these things happen. And when you do, it's time to repent. Look what he says in verse 2. Because a lot of people think that when the Lord comes, this is talking about his second coming. I'm not even talking about the rapture. 
This is the second coming of Jesus. So if the second coming of Jesus is close, how close is the rapture of the church? Because God's going to take the church out before the wrath of God is given. Now, some people don't believe that, so if you want to, then prepare to go through the tribulation. Prepare to have your head cut off for Jesus. So people can't even get up out of bed and go to church on Sunday. Never mind, have their head cut off. Come on, somebody. I'm telling you the truth. In verse 2, he says this. Go to verse 2 for me, please. It's a day of darkness and gloominess. Oh, here we go. Why is it a day of darkness and gloominess? Do you know when, when these locusts hit, man, it blocks the sun? Come on. I know some people would like that. They like shade. <laughs> he said, a day of clouds and of thick darkness. Have you ever experienced thick darkness? Let me tell you something. When I was in India... And I was going through, um, they have a different name for it now. Um, what was it? Uh, Bombay. But they have another name for it now. And I was going through some of the darkest roads you, you have ever seen. No street lights. It was thick darkness. You couldn't see two inches in front of you if it wasn't for the headlights on the car. If you were to get out and stand there, I mean, it, you couldn't even see the houses. That's how thick darkness it was. That's how I experienced it. Look what he says in verse 4. The appearance of them is as appearance of horses and horsemen. So shall they run. We're talking about these locusts fly, by the way. They're about that long. And they fly. Did you know that roaches fly? They have flying roaches, brother. I seen them when I was, <laughs> when I was in uh, India. And those things aren't no little tiny. <laughs> no, they're about that big. I mean, you step on one of those and they yell out, didn't hurt me. You gotta crush that. You gotta you gotta nail that guy. One little shoe bang ain't gonna do it, man. They just look up at you and kind of chuckle at you. But when Jesus comes, he said, These things are gonna happen. They're gonna take place. Are we ready? Are we paying attention? Because this is what God was speaking to my heart. It's time to get serious, folks. It's time to repent. It's time to stop doing the things that we're doing and start living right, making right choices, going to the right places. You know, there was a saying years ago, a person would get so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. But I changed that around. Now we're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. Our main objective isn't to see the kingdom of God advance. Our main objective is to see our life advanced. What's in it for me? What can I do? Where can I go? How can I advance? Nothing wrong with that. But put God first. Amen. Put Him first. That's what we need to do. God was saying, blow the trumpet in Zion. Yet Zion was religious. They had all the festivals. They had all of the sacrifices. They had all of the uh, uh, oblations that they did and, and all of the uh, animal sacrifices that they gave. But something was missing. Anybody know what the thing that was missing? It was God. 
They just became religious. They just went through the motions. But God said, no, I'm looking for a people, so they need to wake up. So blow the trumpet. Blow the trumpet in my, in my city. Blow it in my holy mountain where they think that if they go there, that I'm there. But how many know that the Bible says God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands? You know where he dwells? In you and me. That's where he dwells. Inside of us. And as we collectively come together, we experience the presence of the Lord. As we come together, the hand and the foot and the eye and the ear all has expression. And you come and you worship God and we see it collectively as you come and worship God. And I really believe that the Lord is saying to us in these last days, listen, bring somebody with you. Gather up the sheaves. Bring your sheaves with you. In other words, bring somebody. You say, but I, I don't know what to say. Bring them to church. Bring the sick. We'll lay hands on them. Bring the demon possessed. We'll cast those demons out. Come on. He says in verse 12, oh man, this is a message of doom and gloom. No, the Lord is merciful. He says, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. Now, if you never fasted, don't go fast in 40 days, okay? You'll die. Listen to me. Had a woman one time, we belonged to a ministry many years ago. She started coming to our church. You know, I wasn't the pastor. I was one of the elders. She went to the pastor. I'm going to fast. She fasted 40 days. And she came back and started to tell all the elders what to do, tell what the pastor what to do, and thought she was the cat's pajamas. She had false doctrine besides. She opened herself up, got false doctrine. See, you can't. You've got to do it right. I like what the Bible says, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. That's how you discipline yourself to fast. So you discipline yourself, and you say, okay, I'm going to skip all my lunches for a week. And what I'm going to do during that lunch time is I'm going to spend time with God. Okay. No, you don't watch the Flintstones. Okay. But you spend that time with God. Then after that week's done and you, you go a little further along in your Christianity, you say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fast two meals, my, my breakfast and my lunch. You do that for a week. Then let a couple of weeks go by, whatever. Then you say, you know what? I'm going to fast three meals for three days. But I want to tell you something. When you're in a fast for three days, first day is pretty good. The second day, that's why you should not watch TV. Because I'm going to tell you why. Because every commercial is going to be about food. Okay? You're fasting on that second day, man. I mean, you know, you're feeling pretty good, you know. But now it's getting like 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And all you hear on TV is Snickers, Snickers, and, and candy, and cake, and meat, and all of these temptations. I remember one time I was fasting, and I, that happened to me. About the second day, oh, man, stomach started growling a little bit. I went to Linda. I said, Linda, I'm hungry. I want to eat. She said, stop it. You can make it. I said, okay. Got past the second day. Then I got into the third day. The third day was good. Now I'm telling you, the ministry I had the next day was something else. Because when you fast, 
you enter to a different realm. I remember a story with Linda. I married her. And for a whole year she was praying, oh, I, want, I need the baptism in the Holy Ghost. I want the baptism in the Holy Ghost. For a whole year she cried. She wanted the baptism in the Holy Ghost. And my pastor said to me, come on, we're going to go. Would you like to come with me for a week of fasting and prayer? We're going over to a church in Taunton, and we're going to stay there. We're going to stay right in the church, sleep in the church, the whole thing for a whole week. I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. So I did that, and I went away for, with him for a whole week. We just drank juice and water. That was it. We didn't have any food whatsoever. So on the fifth day, we come back, and my pastor calls me up. See, don't think that I ask you to do anything I haven't done. Just come home. How long were we married anyway? I forget. One year, two years, something like that. We were just married young, you know, just... So I pass a call and said, hello, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, I can do that for you. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I get off the phone and said, what do you want? I said, he wants us to take the Friday night fellowship. She goes, oh, I haven't seen you all week. I want to spend time with you, you know. I want to cook you something to eat, blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, we have to go. That's called responsibility, commitment. So we get there. Bob Lewis was there that night. And you tell me if I'm not telling you the truth. He was sitting right there. I'm telling you, it was a little home meeting, maybe eight or ten people the most. We're at um, 53 Mulberry Circle in Johnston, Rhode Island. And all of a sudden, we just got together and said, okay, time to pray. We started to pray, and God began to move. And I spoke a word to one lady. She broke down and cried, and she said, that's me, blah, 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 blah. I said to another person, you got jealousy and envy in your heart toward a brother, and you need to get it right. And he, he said to me, yeah, it's you, meaning me, and he got that right. And then I came to Linda, because, see, Linda had made a vow. Can I tell you something? Watch out. If you make a vow to God and you don't pay it, you're in trouble. She made a vow, see, when I, when I married her, I said, you've got to promise me two things. She said, what's that? I said, you've got to be willing to eat anything and go anywhere. And she said yes, but she didn't mean it. And I'm telling you, as I'm standing here right now, that was the reason why she was not baptized in the Holy Ghost. She made a vow, because it wasn't me. She made a vow to God, and she didn't keep it. So anyway, bring you right back up to Friday night. Here I am Friday night. I look over, my wife's down on the ground, crying, crying. Didn't say a word, didn't touch her, nothing. She gets up, the first words out of her mouth, I didn't say a word. She said, Lord, I'll go anywhere and I'll eat anything. When she said that, the Spirit of the Lord in me said, I'm going to fill her with the Holy Ghost. She came over, I said, come here, I want to pray for you. I laid my hand on her head. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I've now received the bap. I couldn't get bap out. That was it. And from her innermost being, it rose up in her. Remember that? And she was filled with the Holy Ghost that night. Am I telling the truth, Bob? What I'm telling you right now is this. If we're faithful to him, he will show us mercy. He will show his grace. Look, the Lord said, turn ye even to me with all of your heart. I don't want half-heartedness. I don't want you put the world first and me second. That's not going to fly. You've got to put God first. And the moment that you do, and the moment that you put your, in your heart, you determine, I'm putting God first, guess what happens? God begins to move. He begins to move. And that thing that you've been praying for and that thing you've been desiring for a long time, God will not fulfill it until you put him first.
God is always never there to be a mean, tyrant, dictator. God always says, if you will, repent of your sin, turn to me with your whole heart, with fasting and with weeping and with mourning, what will he do? He will do verse 25. Put up 25 for me. He says, and I will. Say, I will. You don't have to worry if it's God's will or not. God said it is. He said, I will restore to you the years. Not the days or last week or yesterday. He says, I'm going to restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten and the canker worm and caterpillar and the pommel worm. My great army which I send among you. He says, I'm going to restore the years if you do this thing, you come with back to me with all your heart and you fast and you, and you know you weep and you mourn for your sin and mourn for what you're doing. He says, and you get right. This is my plea for America. See, I want to say this, but I want to say it in the right venue, in the right way. Donald Trump is not your source. He's a resource, but he's not a source. Joe Biden is no source. Man is not a source. Come on, somebody. I'm sick and tired of people trying to promise me everything and delivering nothing. But God is using a man. And his name is Donald Trump. Now, some of you don't believe that. We say, well, how can God use an unbeliever? He's not even saved. Turn with me to Isaiah 45 a minute. I'm going to show you how God anoints an unbeliever. And grabs an unbeliever by his hand and leads and guides him. I'm going to show you how God does that. Thus says the Lord, the anointed, to his anointed, to Cyrus. Whoa, 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 whoa. Read that again. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, the king. He calls Cyrus his anointed. Whose right hand I've holden. To subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him and to leave uh, levered gates. And the gate shall not be shut. Next verse, please. I will go before him and make the crooked and make the crooked places straight. And let me tell you, there's a lot of crooks in Washington, D.C. who've made a lot of crooked places, both Democrat and Republican and independent. So that covers the whole base. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut asunder in the bars of iron. Next verse, please. And I will, look at this. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places. Just think of what Donald Trump has done. Now I remember what Barack Obama, President Barack Obama said when Trump promised to bring jobs back to America. He said, what's he going to do, wave a magic wand? 
and bring them back? No, you know what he's going to do? He's going to lower the capital gains tax on, on corporations so that instead of building overseas, they're going to start to build over here. And guess what? They have. Apple's building a multi-billion dollar complex back in America. I think it's Ford or, or Chevy is building another factory back here in America. He negotiated the NAFTA agreement, which was terrible. We got hardly nothing. He, na he, he, he did so many things like that. With NAFTA, the, uh, the uh, Canada agreement, the China agreement, the Japanese agreement, and he started saying, you guys need to stop paying your fair share. Come on, somebody. He said, I'll give the treasures of darkness, hidden riches of secret places. Thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name. God called Cyrus by his name. And am the God of Israel. Donald Trump is for Israel. He's the only president from the, for the time of Truman all the way up that promised to make Jerusalem the capital of Israel. Promise, promise, promise. Never kept until Donald Trump. And he declared, I'm recognizing. And they took the, 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 the um, capital from Tel Aviv and moved it to Jerusalem. Next verse. Watch this now. For Jacob my servant's sake and for Israel my elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known. Put that in the NLT for me, please. Look at this. It is for the sake of Jacob my servant, Israel, my chosen one. I have called you by name when you did not know me. I anointed you, Cyrus, when you didn't know me. And he did the same for Donald Trump. Now, I don't like some of his ways. I don't like some of the things he says. But God has appointed him. And now what we have to do is we have to see if we can continue doing the work that God has already called him to do for these next four years. And if not, Mark my words, if not, you're going to see a great economic collapse in this country like you've never seen before. They're already talking about raising the, if he gets elected, the other guy, he's going to raise the corporate taxes again back into the high 30s. Now you say, what, what's that got to do with anything? Well, if you've got a company making $20 billion a year, okay, that's 60 that's six hundred twenty-four. Yeah, that's six hundred million dollars just in taxes you've got to pay as a corporation. Six hundred million by giving these corporations tax incentives, it helps to pack, they have more money on hand that they can hire more people, they can get better machinery, and so forth and so on. But we got to fast. We got to pray. We got to mourn. We got to cry out to God. We got to seek God so that we can be blessed, so that He can turn all of the things around. Look in uh, one minute before I close here. Let me get back to Joel for a minute, and I want to turn to um, look at Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse ten to fourteen. This describes what has happened in America. Look at what He says. When you have eaten your fill, be sure to praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. But that is the time to be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God and disobey his commands and regulations and decrees that I'm giving you today. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built fine homes to live in, and when your flocks and your herds have become very large and your silver and gold have multiplied along with everything else, 
be careful. Do not become proud at that time and forget the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Can I tell you, America has forgotten God for the most part. Thank God for the remnant that haven't. Thank God for those who are praying for America. Thank God for those who are Christians living in America. But in the time of prosperity, can I tell you, even the church has forgotten God. You say, how, how, how do you know that? Read Revelation. Read the, the church of Laodicea. He said, you're rich, you have need of nothing. Come on. But he said, I, buy, I try you to buy of me gold tried in the fire. In Revelation, Laodicea, he said, Oh, you're rich, and you have plenteous, and you have need of nothing? But God saw him as poor, wretched, miserable, blind, and naked. So it's not what's on the outside. What it looks like on the outside, it's what's on the inside. Come on, somebody. In America, it looks like on the outside, oh, we're so Christian and we do all... You know, when uh, Antifa and all that and all these guys said, we're going to tear down the white statue of Jesus. I, 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 I applauded. <laughs> I was like, yay, get rid of idolatry. If we won't do it, then God will send the enemy to do it. <laughs> they thought I was nuts. Because that has nothing to do with Christianity. It has everything to do with idolatry. We need to get right with God. We're not a nation under God in a sense where we're standing up and saying we are no longer going to kill millions of babies through abortion. We're going to the, the, put the line in the sand and we're going to say we will not accept homosexual marriage. We're not going to we're not going to uh, uh, give our blessing to LGBTQ, elemental P, whatever it is. We're not doing it because I don't know if you know this, and I said this a couple of years ago when they were trying to legalize all this stuff. I said, "You mock my words." I said this to somebody. I said, "You mock my words." The next thing they're going to want to do is legalize having sex with children. Pedophiles. And you know something? There's something before the courts right now that they want to make the, the consenting age of sexual relationships four years old. And can I tell you, when you have a nation and you have a country that goes down that low, God said it's better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and cast into the deepest part of the sea than to offend one of these little ones. God is not happy with America. God has not damned America. Like Obama's former pastor said, no, 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 no. God has not damned America. I just told you, if you repent of your sin, if you come and confess, if you fast and you pray and you mourn and you weep and you get right with me, he said, I will restore the years that the canker worm and the pommel worm have destroyed. But you've got to do this first. And my prayer is that God will do that with America. You know, we all stand in time of crisis. When we're in crisis, we stand and we, we can pray on the Capitol steps and the, the Senate and the Congress come together and they stand on the steps and they pray. And no one cries out, separation, church, and state, when there's a crisis. But can I tell you, we need to do that right now. Can we all stand right now? Can we pray a prayer, a militant prayer? Brother Bob, you're going to take care of that for me, right? We need to pray.
We need to come together with one accord, with one mind, with one heart. And we need to stand against the devil. Lucifer, who has been loosed upon this earth to destroy you and your family, to destroy your children, to destroy their heritage, to destroy what God has planned for them. And he spills the lies through Hollywood and through God, uh, and through uh, record artists. And those that uh, are rappers and all those kinds of people that are out there in Hollywood. Because they want to that, that the devil wants to destroy your children, destroy their heritage, destroy their future. But I'm serving the devil notice right now that we're not going to stand for it anymore. That we're going to take our position in Christ. And we're going to unite together as Christians because we don't need guns. Because they come with swords and spears, but we come in the name of the Lord our God. Because He is the mighty one of Israel. He is the mighty one of Israel. It's time you get tough with the devil. It's time you start coddling the devil. Stop coddling him. Stop giving in to him. Begin to take your rightful place as a soldier in God's army and say, no more devil. You're not going to take me. You're not going to take my family. You're not going to take my children. You're not going to take my wife. You're not going to take my husband. It's time, church, to rise up and say no more. So let's pray right now. The Bible says that when, when one prays, it puts a thousand to flight. When two pray, ten thousand to fight. We have about 40 people here this morning. Hallelujah. And we can see thousands be put to flight in the name of Jesus. So let's cry out to him this morning and say, no more mediocrity in my life. No more half-heartedness in my life. Devil, you have lied to me long enough, and I'm not going to take it anymore. I'm not going to stand for it anymore. I'm going to be fully committed to Christ. I'm going to give him my spirit, soul, mind, and body, and I'm going to serve him, and him only am I going to serve. Now is the time. Now is the time. Now is the time. Don't keep your focus on the battle. Keep your focus on the Lord because it will look like you're losing the battle. But can I tell you, and the end result is God will have the victory. Hallelujah. God will have the victory. He said in his word that we have the victory in Christ Jesus always, always, no matter what it looks like. Hallelujah. 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 Lord God, we come today, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray right now together, corporately together, and ask you to forgive us of our sins, Lord. Those sins of omission and commission, Lord. The things we should have done that we didn't do and the things we shouldn't have done that we did. Forgive us, Lord. Cleanse us, Lord. Lord, help us to live righteously. Help us to live right. Send the revival, Lord. Hallelujah. The revival song. Hallelujah. Give us, Lord, hearts on fire for you. You said you would baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. God baptize us with the Holy Ghost and fire. To take authority in the name of Jesus. Don't let the devil rob you of this moment. Don't let the devil rob you of your future. By living in the present. Some of you have a hard time living in the present because you keep digging up the future. I mean the past. You keep digging up the past and the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And he comes and he tells you, you're no good because you did this and you did that and you did this. 
Can anyone identify what I'm saying right now this morning? If you're serious with God this morning, I want you to come up right now to this altar. And I want you to get rid of that shovel of the past that you keep digging up the past of your life. And you start saying, God, I'm no longer that person. That you have cleansed me. You have washed me. You have delivered me. Hallelujah. I'm yours, God. I don't belong to anyone else. I belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. I belong to Jesus. I don't belong to anyone else. I don't belong to the prosperity of this world. I don't belong to my husband or my wife. I don't belong to anybody but you, Lord. On my future, on my job, on my education. God, I belong to you. Jesus, we, we cry out to you this morning. We say, have your way, God. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. Have your way, God. No more half-heartedness. No more lukewarmness. I want to be on fire for you, God. I want to be on fire for you, God. I want to be an instrument in your hands, God. No more, God. No more lukewarmness. No more indecision, God. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Cry out to him. Cry out to him. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Get this Word inside of you. Get this Word inside of you. It will keep you. It'll keep you. It'll keep you. But you got to put it in in order to get it out. Hallelujah. 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 In the book of Zephaniah, it says this. It's on my spirit. I got to say this. In the day of God's wrath, the Bible says, neither will their silver or their gold be able to deliver them. People are going crazy buying gold and silver. But the word of God says, guess what? In the day of my wrath, that's not going to help them at all because they're looking to the natural for sustenance. And I'm going to tell you, it's going to take the hand of Almighty God and His provision in your life. Hallelujah. God is good. God's looking for a few good soldiers. Because you're in the army of the Lord. Father, we want to be in your army. How many times God told you to do something and you refuse, you hold back. Don't let him put his anointing on somebody else. Don't lose that anointing. Don't lose the anointing. This is the time. This is the season. This is the time for you, for your greatness to shine as the body of Christ. Not one individual above another, but as the body of Christ, now is your time. Now is your time to stand for righteousness, to stand for the principles of God's Word. It's not going to be easy. You have an enemy that knows Covert operations. 
There's a devil that has followed you all of your life, knows every button to push, knows every philosophy and ideology to get you to think. That's why the Bible says, renew your mind. Renew your mind. Renew it to what God says, not what the world says. Can I tell you, I'd rather fail with God than fail without Him. Because I know I can get back up again. I know I can get back up again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know that God will restore me again. But the Bible says, Woe unto him who falls and there's no one to help. Praise God. Father, we commit ourselves to you right now. We dedicate ourselves, our children, our family, our friends, everything that you have, God, we want in our life. We dedicate ourselves to your righteousness, to your holiness. We dedicate ourselves, Lord, no matter how much the flesh will yank at us. But let your spirit, let your spirit lead and guide us. Hallelujah. No more lies of the enemy. Tell the Lord, say, Lord, I'm laying that shovel down of the past. You know, when, it, when a person surfs, they have a, a line that's attached to the surfboard and they attach it to their wrist. You'll never get rid of that shovel of the past if there's a cord of unforgiveness attached to you. You've got to get rid of the unforgiveness. And the moment that you do, the moment you do, God will release you. Put that shovel away, never to return. You're not who you were. You may not be who you need to be, but you're not who you were. Because God's still working on you. He's still moving in you. He's still developing you. He's still changing you. He's still forming you. He's still shaping you. If you have if you have, if you will, turn to Him. He will restore you in the years that the locusts and the comma worm have destroyed. You must get rid of the word of compromise in your life. And the moment you do, the moment we get rid of compromise, God will make a stand in your life. Oh, Rabababosha. Hallelujah. And you'll see the glory of the Lord and the power of His Holy Spirit upon you. So we promise you this day, God, we're not just here at the altar. We're not just here in this congregation just to lie and just to tell you things that the preacher wants to hear. But we're here because we have a sincere heart of repentance, God. And I believe, God, that as we are sincere in repentance, that you will begin to blow the winds of revival once again in this city. God, that revival that started on Martha's Vineyard, God, when I was there, I sensed your spirit of revival still there, God. Though they're preaching all kinds of false teaching and compromise but I sensed in that place your spirit was still there on Martha's vineyard and you said to me that revival is possible again it's it's possible again but it's up to us it's up to us Lord so today let this be the beginning today let this be the beginning of a shout of praise of a shout, oh God, of commitment to you. And we thank you and we praise you for what you're doing. For what you're doing, God. You are equipping us. You are calling us. You are stirring us by your Spirit. And we thank you and we praise you. 
in the name that is above every name. Because you truly are the Lion of Judah. Hallelujah. And you do break every chain. Hallelujah. And we thank you and we praise you. Now, Father, as we go our separate ways, speak to our hearts even today as we're home this afternoon. Speak to our hearts, Lord, and let us not forget what you have called us to. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen, amen, amen. God bless you this morning.